Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Uigo United Methodist Church. Those of you here in the sanctuary and those of you that are online. And uh, we have some uh, opportunities for ministry. Today, of course, is our celebration of worship. Tomorrow, the office is closed for President's Day. And uh, Tuesday, though, the knitting group will meet at 10 a.m., the conversations with Nancy from 2 and 6, 2 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. Um, please sign up on the back. There are lists where you can, uh, and if you have, if you have to come on a different time, talk to Nancy. She may have 
time when she can meet with you. She likes to hear what people have to think about. Wednesday, the men's group, 9 a.m., 3.30, conversations with Nancy again, and 5 to 6 p.m., prayer group, and 6.30 p.m., the Administrative Council will meet. All are welcome. Thursday, uh, 2, 30, 2 to 3.30 and 6.30 to 8 p.m., there's Bible study. And um, the uh, title is 24 Hours That Changed the World. There are more books on the back table uh, that came in this week. And um, if you would like to join by Zoom, please let Nancy know, and she can send, set that up for you. Okay. And um, next Sunday, the 25th of February at 9.30 a.m. Sunday School, 10.30 the Celebration of Worship, and we will have Blanket Sunday. In your bulletin, there is a list of uh, how much each set of blankets costs the uh, church world services to dedicate to people that are in need. And uh, But if there is an amount that you want to give that's different from anything that's there, more than welcome. Just make out any checks to the, um, uh, the to the church, to the church, okay, to We Go United Methodist, and then they will send one check to church world services. Um, I guess, is there any other announcements that need to be made? Oh, uh, spiritual gifts inventory. Nancy has a box on the table. Please fill out your uh, questionnaire and put it in the box. And uh, the blessings box outside. We're still in need, especially this time of year where it's kind of cold out there for people who might be uh, unable to afford as much food as they would like. And maybe if we had some out in the blessings box, we could, you know, help them out. I guess that's all. So there's no others. Okay, you want to stand for the call to worship? <clears throat> May we come expectantly, listening intently for what God has to say to us. May we truly consider what means Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. May we come in closer relationship to our Lord during this Lenten season than we have ever been before. May, May we come confident in the fact that we are already. Remain standing if you can. First hymn is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, page 89. In your hymnal or on the wall.
Amen. You may be seated. We can adore our Lord with joy because he is so faithful to us. Now, having lifted our voices in praise, can we turn our hearts to confession? Would you pray with me as printed in your bulletin or on the wall? Merciful God, we confess that with all the struggles we face, we are not always joyful. We also don't want to be confronted with what Jesus did on the cross because that makes us uncomfortable. Forgive us and help us to see all of this in a new light that our faith may be enlivened. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Silently now let us confess our personal sins before Almighty God. Hear the good news. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. In the name of Jesus Christ, each one of us is forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I would invite any children out there who would like to come and anyone of any age. How you doing? Good, good. Thanks be to God. This is the most kids we've had up here in a while. Yeah, all right. All right. So um, Mr. Bear definitely needed his scarf this morning. It's cold out, isn't it? Yeah. So if you have something for the heifer project for Mr. Bear, you can put it in there. That would be great. And do you want to pass that down to Blake? Thanks, Blake. All right. So... Um, so Coraline, this is going to be a review for you because it's what we did in Sunday school, okay? But not everybody out there knows or needs to be reminded, so we're going to be reminding them, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So I have some eggs. So a dozen eggs. Mm -hmm. How many is that? Um, like 12. Like 12, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like 12. <laughs> um, and uh, so each week of Lent, which is the kind of church season we're in now, I know it's winter, mm -hmm. but it's a church season we're in now, and we're going to take two of these every week. We're going to talk about them um, because they're symbols of the last week of Jesus' life on this earth. Okay? When that he walked as a human, okay? We know he lives in us now, in our hearts, right? Hope, I hope we know that. Okay, so I need somebody to open this for me. One, two, there you go. Okay, oh, okay. Can you get it open? There you go. What's inside? 
A donkey. Hmm. Do you know any stories about a donkey the last week of Jesus' life? Yeah? Sure. Hmm. Not sure. Coraline? When he rode a donkey. Yeah, he rode a donkey into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, do you remember that what it meant if a king rode a donkey? That he's coming in peace. That he's coming in peace. And a king coming on a horse meant what? Do you remember? That he's coming for war. And Jesus came on a what? So he was coming for peace. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've got that one. And can you give that back to me? And then, okay. Or Coraline, you want to put that together for me? And all right. Somebody want to open another one? Anyway, do you want? Here you go. Macy. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to reach in front of you, Coraline. Okay. Can you tell what those are? They're coins. Right. Now. Hmm. This is a this is a tougher one. Do we know anything about coins the last week of Jesus? Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. So Coraline, do you remember? No, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, there is a story about a woman donating all she had. Yep, yep. Um, uh, and that's a good story. That's a good story. Yes, Blake. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. So um, these coins are to remind us that one of Jesus' followers named Judas got paid for showing people where they could arrest Jesus. Right? Not so good, huh? Not so good. Um, but then when he got arrested, Judas realized that he had made a big mistake. And he was very sad, and he tried to give the money back. And they said, "Man, that's your problem. We got what we wanted. And, um, but, so that's why there are coins in that particular egg. Um, so we had a donkey and we had coins. And next week, hmm? and next week we're going to look at, we're, we're going to, they're going to be different colors. They're going to be light purple and orange next week. So, so, okay. Yep. Yep. Very good. All right. So, um, but it's, it's really important to remind ourselves and, and remind everybody out there about the last week of Jesus' life because he showed us how much he loved us and that he would do anything for us, including to die for us. Okay? The good news is he didn't stay dead. He rose and he lives in our hearts. Okay? So, would you pray after me? Dear God, thank you for showing us how much you love us and what Jesus did for us. Thanks, God. May we always be followers of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Okay, you can go back to your seats now.
Thank you, choir. It's beautiful. Friends, do you have joys or concerns to share this morning? We had four kids for the children's time. That was good. Yes. That was great. So... And let's see, anybody else? Um, you know, Austin, uh, Brenda's daughter, is still waiting on the baby. Hopefully tomorrow. Yes, Brenda's saying, keep praying. Keep praying. So. Okay. Anyone else? Um, it's been a joy to go through the uh, spiritual gift inventories that have come back so far. So for those of you who have brought them back, thank you so much. And for those of you still to bring them back, we appreciate that. Thank you. And um, gleaning some really uh, wonderful information from those. And also, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit uh came upon our, our Thursday Bible study sessions, and uh, we had some really cool discussions. So uh, it's not too late to join, and we got more books. So, And if we need to get more books, that, that would make me exceedingly happy. So, um, and, uh, so please feel free to, to join us for that. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, this day we're focusing on the, the body and blood of Christ. And the choir just sang for us beautifully about remembering what you did for us. And our communion liturgy says that we want to be 
the body of Christ in this world redeemed by his blood. And to be that witness in the world. So we live in our earthly bodies, trusting in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. That's what we're focusing on today and throughout Lent. Come, Holy Spirit, upon us. Make your presence known in an unmistakable way. Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless the efforts of those working for peace throughout our world. We continue to pray for an end to the war in Ukraine. For an end to the war between Israel and Hamas. We pray that the saber-rattling saber would cease. that swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks when war will be studied no more. We were just reminded in the children's time that Jesus came into Jerusalem riding a donkey, which meant he was coming for peace. As followers of Jesus, may we be peacemakers in this world, not peace breakers, but peace makers. And so, Lord, we ask for your blessing of wisdom and courage for our world leaders, including President Biden. We pray this also for our church leaders, for our bishop, Hector Burgos, and our district superintendent, Bob Colvett Campbell. And Lord, we pray for those in need of your healing touch, whether in body, mind, spirit, relationship, or situation. We continue to lift up baby Max, Donnie, Bev, Judy, Donna, Rich, John, Nelda, Dave, Tyler, Dick and Lorraine, Frank, David, Tracy, Eileen, Jerry, Shelley, Hugh, Renee, all of our shut-ins. Lord, those devastated by natural disasters help them to literally pick up the pieces of their lives and move on. Lord, bring comfort to all who mourn. Continue to remember the people of Sudan and Ukraine, that you would give them what they need. Provide for migrants from Central America. Lessen the tensions between Palestinians and Israelis. And, oh, Lord, we lift up Austin to you, awaiting the joyous birth of their baby. Keep Austin and baby safe and healthy. Speak peace to her. Speak peace to Brenda and, and all of the family. And again, we say, come Holy Spirit upon this congregation of the Oigo United Methodist Church. We see ways that your spirit is working 
in big ways and small ways and all the ways in between, Lord, and, and we just thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the encouraging signs, for making your presence known. And Lord, may we go into this world as the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Use us and help us to remember and rejoice. We pray all this in the name of Jesus and continue to pray as he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Acknowledging that all that we have and all that we are belongs to God, let us offer unto him his rightful tithe, our offerings and ourselves. The ushers, please come forward. Be
bless and guide the use of these gifts that they may be used to further your kingdom so that more and more may come to know what it means that Jesus body was broken and his blood was shed for us so that we could know we are forgiven may more people come to know that blessed truth Bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please remain standing for our next hymn, Let Us Be Bread, found in the uh, Faith We Sing on page 2260. And do I understand the choir is going to sing verses? Beverly's going to sing verses, and we will sing the refrain that is in the faith we sing. Great. Okay. Thank you.
The scripture lesson for today is found in, in Mark 14, beginning at the 12th verse. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after the other, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Ellie. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds and our actions in response be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. You are no doubt familiar with the phrase, what a difference a day makes. Right? Of course, that can be positive or negative. At the risk of bringing up painful memories, there was quite a difference between September 6, 2011 and, two th and September 7, 2011 in Oigo, right? Normal one day, under several feet of water the next. What a difference a day makes. September 10th, 2001. To September 11th, 2001. The day the whole world changed. What a difference a day makes. March 2nd, 1974. I'd been raised in the church. I had perfect attendance in Sunday school. I sang in the choir. I was president of the youth group. But I didn't have a relationship with Christ. March 3rd, 1974. I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. What a difference a day makes. Coming up on my 50th anniversary of becoming a Christian. How about that? So why all this talk about what a difference a day makes? This past Thursday, we began a Bible study called 24 Hours That Changed the World. It's the name of a book by Adam Hamilton, pastor of the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas. Every weekend, I believe over 10,000 persons worship there or on one of their other campuses and many more online. Adam Hamilton was our study leader at Upper New York session of annual conference uh, a few years ago, and I had the privilege of serving him communion. The study is not new, as it came out in 2009, but it is timeless. 
The study covers the time from the Last Supper through the crucifixion, or what we call Monday, Thursday, to Good Friday. And then there's one session on the resurrection. The Holy Spirit led me to offer this study during Lent and to turn it into a sermon series as well. So let's take a look at the passage Ellie read for us, which describes the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples. This is what we looked at this past Thursday at Bible study. Again, it's not too late to join us. If you want to come on Thursday, we'd love to have you. Both the afternoon and evening sessions contain some really good discussions. So Jesus sent two of his disciples to make preparations for the Passover meal. They were to find a man carrying a jar of water and ask him where the guest room was so they could prepare the Passover meal there. By the way, a man carrying water in public would have really stuck out because that's what women did. Then we're told that it was, when it was evening, they came to what we would call the upper room and took their places. When we think of the Last Supper, we, most of us probably think of Da Vinci's painting with all the disciples at a long table. It is far more likely that they dined at something called a triclinium, which is a U-shaped table low to the ground. I tried to find, I didn't even find a good picture of it on the internet. There's some pictures, but... None of them were, were fantastic, so sorry about that. Would have liked to have shown that to you. But a U-shaped table, low to the ground. Jesus and the disciples would have reclined at the table, leaning on their left elbow and using their right hand to reach for things and to eat. Jesus would not have sat in the middle, but at a place on the left side. The places of honor at the table were to the left and right of Jesus. We believe John was on his right. Guess who was on his left at the other place of honor? If you thought, Peter, you're wrong. I heard some people say it. It was Judas. It was Judas. Judas at the place of honor. What's up with that? Jesus knew that Judas would betray him shortly, and yet he was given a place of honor at the table. Let me ask an important question. If you knew you were eating your last meal, who would you invite to be there? Would you invite somebody who you knew was going to betray you? I can't imagine doing that, but that's what Jesus did. Not only was Jesus included, he was given a place of honor. I shared with you in the fall about a hand-carved olive wood, what I call masterpiece, of Jesus washing Peter's feet that I bought on one of my trips to the Holy Land. And I, I shared with both Bible studies on Thursday that on an earlier trip there, I bought an olive wood chalice for communion. You're welcome to come and take a look at it after the service. The carving is more reminiscent of Da Vinci's Last Supper, but as I shared on Thursday, the reason I bought it was because there were 13 at the table. If there had not been 13, I wouldn't have bought it. Why? Because I figured if there's room for Judas at the table, there's room for me. If there's room for Judas, then there's room for me. Judas is welcome at the table, so am I. So are you. The next part of the passage, the meal is described to us. But it was not the actual Passover meal. Now the disciples, all Jewish, would have been at a Passover meal every year of their lives. They knew what was supposed to happen when. There was unleavened bread because there was no time to use yeast when the Hebrew people were being 
freed from their bondage in Egypt. There was a lamb as a reminder that the blood of the lamb was painted over the doorposts of the Hebrews' houses so the plague of the firstborn of each house dying would not be visited upon them. The angel of death would pass over each house where the blood was seen over the door, hence the word Passover. There would have been salt water to remind them of all the tears that had been shed for the four centuries of slavery. Parsley would be dipped in the salt water throughout the meal. There were the bitter herbs like horseradish, again as a reminder of the bitterness of being in bondage. There were eggs believed to be an ancient symbol of suffering. And Charlseth, which was like an applesauce with raisins, figs, nuts, and honey which was to remember the mortar of the bricks that they had to make in bondage. And four diluted cups of wine to remember the four promises God gave to the Hebrew people as they were being freed from bondage. In our communion liturgy, do you remember these words? After supper, he took the cup. Right? As I said, the disciples would have known each part of the meal ritual, but it must have gotten their attention when Jesus changed the script. The meal would still be about remembrance, but not of freedom from bondage. It would be remembrance of Jesus. Here's an excerpt from Adam Hamilton's book. A man in his early 40s died after a long bout with cancer, leaving behind a wife and two children. There was a particular casserole that was his favorite meal. Once a week, his wife would continue to prepare this meal. And she and the children, as she and the children ate, she would tell her children stories of their father. And they would recall their own memories of him in a way that... Um, their own memories of dad and his his chair sat empty at the table and they remembered him in a way that made them feel close to him and that continued to shape their lives then hamilton went on to say i wonder if this is not what jesus had in mind when he said as often as you do this remember me Now, it doesn't say that in our passage from mark this morning nor does it say it in matthew that's actually from luke's account of the last supper where he says, do this in remembrance of me. What a cool way for that family to remember their husband and dad. That sounds like a really healthy practice to me. Another aspect of the Last Supper is that of covenant. There are covenants all through Scripture. There's the covenant of God in Genesis 9 that God will set his bow in the clouds as a sign that he will never again that never again will the whole earth be covered in a flood so every time we see a rainbow we can be reminded that god is true to his word then there was the covenant with abraham later to be called abraham or abram later to be called abraham that he would be the father of many nations and then the covenant with the tablets with the 10 commandments on them were placed in the ark of the what Oh, covenant, Ark of the Covenant. Hmm, yeah, there's that word again. By the way, that Ark is not to be confused with Noah's Ark. It's not even close, okay? One was a box and one was a huge boat. <laughs> the Hebrew people had broken covenant many times. Despite their unfaithfulness, in Jeremiah uh, 31, uh, 31 to 34, the prophet tells us that God is making a new covenant with the Israelites, not written on stone like the Ten Commandments and not replacing the Ten Commandments, but the new covenant will be written on people's hearts. The new covenant will not be about following rules, but be, will be about entering into relationship with God. What's that referring to? Back to our communion liturgy again. Remember? And Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant. 
poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. When Jesus said that, Adam Hamilton reminds us that Jesus changed everything. The old covenant was based on the blood of animals that had to be repeated again and again. With Jesus, his shed blood for us on the cross was once and for all. So the Passover meal was to celebrate God's deliverance, God's liberation of the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt. Jesus changed everything when the story was now about God's liberation of all people, not from slavery, but from the bondage of sin and death. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus is inviting all of humanity to be his covenant people, to enter into relationship with God the Father through Jesus. Well, so what, Nance? Well, here's what. We each have stories of how God has delivered us or we wouldn't be here in the sanctuary or worshiping online. I hope you've had times partaking of communion that were profoundly sacred and deeply joyful. If you haven't, I hope you will experience that next time. What if next time we partake of communion, we remember how our Lord has delivered us and celebrate the fact that we are forgiven no matter what we've done. sermon title is Remember and Rejoice. When we remember our Lord's faithfulness in the past, we can be strengthened for the present and the future, and so we can rejoice. When we partake of Holy Communion, my prayer is that we are not just going through the motions and wishing it wouldn't lengthen the time of the service. In our Bible study on Thursday, one of the things that struck me was that The Passover is the defining moment for the Jewish people. What is our defining moment as Christians? Knowing that we have been freed from the power of sin and death. We are forgiven. That is what we celebrate in communion. Communion doesn't have to be somber. It can be joyful. I may have shared with you before about how in a former church I served, a little girl wanted to come up for seconds for communion, and her father let her. I love that! Oh, that we would receive all the grace our Lord offers us. I'm so grateful that he let her come for seconds. Now, I realize that she may just have wanted more bread, but friends, the symbolism of coming for more grace was powerful. I shared in Bible study, and I may have shared this with you before, about a passage in 1 Corinthians that Paul writes about that has always confused me until a colleague straightened me out. Remember, Paul was not at the Last Supper. He came on the scene quite a bit later, after the crucifixion and resurrection. My guess is that he learned about communion, that Paul learned about communion from Peter, because Peter was there. Peter was at the Last Supper. The part that always confused me was when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that when we partake of communion, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I never understood that part about proclaiming Jesus' death until he comes again. I I just didn't understand it. My colleague asked me what Jesus accomplished on the cross, and I said, our forgiveness. He then explained to me, that's what we're proclaiming. We're proclaiming our forgiveness. Now there's something about which to remember and be and rejoice. Friends, there's folks out there who don't know they are forgiven. So in a sense, they're still in bondage. What if the next time we partake of communion, we say yes to the covenant? What if the next time we partake of communion, we remember that we are forgiven no matter what we've done? Another name for communion is Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. What if the next time we partake of communion, we remember as the Gospel of John reminds us that Jesus calls us his friends. You can't choose your family, but you do choose your friends, and Jesus chooses us. Jesus chooses us. Let that sink in. Jesus chooses
Friends, if you haven't entered into a relationship with Jesus, please talk to me after the service. He so wants to be in relationship with every one of us. Our Lord has delivered us from slavery to sin and death. What if the next time we partake of communion, we remember and rejoice? May it be so. Our final hymn this morning is In Remembrance of Me in the, uh, in the, uh, it's in the TW, as the faith we sing, 2254. Please stand, if you're able. Family of God, body of Christ redeemed by his blood, go forth in peace, knowing that you are forgiven, that Jesus chooses you, and Jesus chooses you. Me. Remember and rejoice. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you this day and always. Amen.
Thank you, Squire.